Isn't this a nice space? Yeah. I'm so glad everybody uh, we could we could have this uh, for our to continue our discussion. It's a it's a, it's a nice room, isn't it? And and uh, so I'm happy we can uh, have our third uh, day of discussions here and uh, and. It, and we even got the perfect size table, it looks like. So, so this is great. And uh, so I'm really happy to be here again today with Alain and uh, to move from being an event Tuesday, yesterday, the imminence of worlds. And today we'll, uh, I'm not sure how this dialectic works, but we'll move back to the middle, uh, to uh, Logique des Mondes, and, and so I'll just, I'll just say uh, uh, a couple of words, um, really just, just reminding us of some of the points that, that Alain raised. I, I'm going to close the door. Maybe can somebody close the door because it's a reading room out there. Thanks. Um, just, to, just to remind us of a couple of the, the points uh, that Alain raised uh, in terms of... Um, unfinished business in being an event that called forth um, the work on Logics of Worlds um, in, toward 2006. Uh, and, and so the question in being an event uh, was a question, uh, one of the questions it raised was what sort of a multiplicity, what type of multiplicity uh, can be universal, uh, not just that multiplicity in its status as a singularity, as a generic set, but furthermore, uh, how, what are the forms of appearance, forms of existence of any given generic set in a world, a situation, a world. And as we move toward logics of worlds, Ken yesterday uh, uh, recalled for us the, 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 the wonderful uh, distinction in its, in its opening pages uh, between a dominant situation of democratic materialism and and I'm bad use response to that uh, uh, dominance of what he called a materialist dialectic that he pursues in logics of worlds. And Tuesday then uh, raised a number of difficulties that became apparent moving beyond being an event. The first one was that a situation, a given situation, there is only defined as a multiplicity in, a, in, a, in an abstraction, that the status of that statement is in some sense too general and needed to be further developed. Uh, and to address the question of existing structures and a study of the structures of any given situation or world, what in fact is a world, what constitutes a world. Secondly, the question of an event, there in being an event, there was in a sense no uh, general theory offered of change, of probability, of tendencies, The question of what is possible in any given world wasn't sufficiently clarified in being an event. Thirdly, we raised the question of universality moving out of being an event. That in being an event, uh, universality itself only receives a, a negative definition. Right? And that genericity, the generic, uh, uh, is not directly reducible to the properties of a situation. And so logics of worlds then sets forth a new 
theory of singularity that's not simply abstractly generic, but of singularity as such. The question of the subject is further developed there, uh, not simply as, a, as, a, as an infinite procedure, a truth procedure, uh, but also in its various forms, possible forms of appearance, uh, those various subjects, modes, we might say, of the subject are uh, uh, presented systematically in book one. The subject itself is a, is a positive concept in being an event. Uh, but there are also further forms of subjectivity to be spelled out and, and, and uh, formalized in logics of worlds, including, as I said, negative forms of the subject uh, in, in response to an event, coming after an event, but nonetheless not uh, simply affirmative of that event, and so a typology of forms of subject. And in logics, we find a theory of sets, a theory of categories, and above all, a formal theory of worlds and the forms of configuration, of being. And uh, in, in, in preparing for today, uh, we tried to make a selection of some of the, some of the key uh, texts and, and, and elements to the argument itself, the preface and this distinction between democratic materialism and materialist dialectic that was already raised, uh, and also, I think, the, the, the wonderfully uh, suggestive, creative, uh, uh, and inventive book one and the formal theory of the subject for me and my work on, on, on post-colonial studies and francophone uh, and the Haitian Revolution, the passages on Spartacus and Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution were um, absolutely key in, in, in allowing me to try to, uh, to try to think through what a figure like Toussaint Louverture um, was uh, 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 was accomplishing politically, but also formally as a as a theory of the subject in a situated world. In that case. Saint-Domingue, Haiti, the Haitian Revolution. I think all of us probably have our own uh, examples of different worlds in question in which this uh, sort of a, uh, the, the, this, this process of formalization and the exploration of the various manifestation, uh, forms of manifestation in worlds and their transformations uh, allows us to do many, many things in so many different directions. And, and I find this book so powerfully suggestive and uh, 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 such a creative operation. And, and then we tried to pick uh, a couple of other sections that, that would also allow us to focus in on uh, uh, some of the key operations in question uh, on the transcendental and on the point. And then, as Ken mentioned as well, we wanted to be sure to include the beautiful uh, conclusion, what is it to live? Uh, but of course, like, like being an event, like as we heard yesterday, eminence of truth, it's, this, is, this is a world unto itself. And, uh, uh, there's, there's plenty to explore. And uh, so, so I'll just stop there and, and I'll, I'll let uh, Alain uh, pursue the, pick up the discussion and, and see where it leads us. Today we, we, uh, we're scheduled to go till 6.30 and, and let's, see, let's see where we are then. Uh, and after, after Alan speaks, then we'll, like we did Tuesday, we'll open it up uh, and, and try to look at uh, some passages closely. <coughs> Alan. Yes, so, so 
the true beginning of the idea of a new book after being an event was uh, the critique of being an event by a great uh, French philosopher of uh, mathematics, Jean Toussaint de Santy. Jean Toussaint de Santy uh, read very <coughs> in a very new and strong manner being an event and he write a paper in Les Temps Modernes uh, concerning being an event. And uh, Jean Toussaint de Santy objects to my construction that there exists an other global presentation of mathematics which is radically different from theory of sets. It's theory of categories. Theory of categories created between the 40s and the 60s by lawyers and some others. And so, De Santi thinks that uh, I think that uh, in some sense is not really possible to say that ontology is mathematics if the only support to that sort of affirmation is theory of sets. And his vision was that theory of sets in some sense, maintains the idea of substance. A set is a unité composed of elements, and it is why he named intrinsic, 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 intrinsic ontology, ontology which is which size the the thing as such. And uh, he affirmed that in theory of categories, there is another proposition, completely different, which is that mathematics is not at all reducible to a theory of some entities, sets, but is only a general theory of relations. And so, the accusation of uh, De Santi was that I remained a substantialist <coughs> in the field of uh, ontology because uh, even if maybe mathematics is ontology, is certainly not because it's a theory of multiplicities, but because it's a theory of relations. Maybe uh, theory of relations between multiplicities, but uh, also theory of relations between two different relations, for example. And uh, we can say also that with theory of category, it's not only a question of functions of a set to a set, as is a classic presentation, but a new uh, thinking of relations between objects, objects which are indifferent. It can be sets, but uh, there is no obligation that objects be sets. So it has been the point of departure of a great meditation. <coughs> for me. <laughs> and it was a mathematical meditation because it takes the form of a long and difficult study of theory of categories <clears throat> during many years. During many years. And I have organized 
Every Saturday, the seminar concerning theory of categories. And you can find a very good book concerning my study of mathematics of the transcendental, mathematics of categories, under the title Mathematics of Transcendental, which can be realized by my Australian friend Adam Bartlett and Justine Clements, which have been published, and where we find the result of my seminars concerning theory of categories. But as you know, if the name is Mathematics of Transcendental, <coughs> you can suspect that I refuse the idea that theory of categories is an ontology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> after that, we have also, after the critique of uh, Jean Toussaint de Santé, we have uh, Nick uh, was uh, saying about uh, the question of the theory of subject and the question of uh, concerning universality. Just some words concerning the modification of the theory of subject. It's a, 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 there is a, a, something like a story concerning the modification of the theory of subject. Because I was in New York, in fact, <laughs> and in the snow, <laughs> very big snow. And it was impossible to go to Los Angeles <laughs> to see my friend. <laughs> so I was blocked in New York in the snow. Uh, really a uh, stranger in the snow. And uh, I have suddenly a new idea concerning the subject. So it's a New York, uh, New Yorker's uh, idea. And uh, the idea was, in fact, in its first form, that why subject would be exclusively a positive category. Why subject would be, in some sense, a normative category. And so the layer, I think, that it was not the case that it was impossible to affirm uh, that subject must be not only an ontological concept in some sense, but also an ethical concept. And so uh, the point was to divide the category of subject, and naturally it was by necessity in regard to the event, because the event is the absolute beginning of the possibility of a new subject. And so, uh, I think that finally we have two possible positions concerning an event, and not only one. First, we must recognize that the event is an event, and it's not a necessity. An event don't say that it's an event. <coughs> we must decide in some sense, and it's the first manifestation of a subject, we must decide that an event is an event, and the act of the decision is to name the event, to give a name to the event. So we can recognize the event, and the complete recognition of an event is to accept the consequences of the event. Not only to say, okay, there is an event, <coughs> but to be engaged in the consequences of the event, and to become what I can name an activist of the event. And in fact, in my vision, there is no creation and finally no truth without activist this truth. <coughs> it's not only the case in politics. 
but in cre artistic creation and uh, in uh, new theory in science and, and naturally also in the adventure of law. <coughs> All that is by necessity the result of some form of existence of this activist subjectivity. Though it's the first form, the first form of the subject is to be an activist of the consequences of the event. And as you know, it's the faithful subject, where the subject is defined by its faithfulness in regard to the event. The second possibility is to assume, to accept the existence of an event but in uh, the vision that we don't accept consequences in some sense. And it's a position, a divided position in some sense, to recognize the possibility of uh, something new, but uh, to affirm that uh, it's not a necessity to be an, an activist of this novelty and to organize the situation in the sense that there is finally no consequences of the event. What is always a possibility? It's not a necessity, the existence of the consequences of an event in a large sense. It's a subjective realization. So we can accept uh, the existence of an event, but in the modality of an incorporation of the event in the world as it is. So it's a sort of normalization of the event, or the reduction of the event, the final reduction of the event to a pure fact. It's uh, uh, the position of a reactive subject and the third possible position is the negation of the existence of the event as such and the idea to destroy all realization, all false consequences of uh, the false event. And uh, it's the obscure subject. Naturally, in my mind, the, ob the obscure subject was all the form of fascism. <coughs> that is the reaction to uh, the revolutionary event by the destruction of all consequences of uh, uh, this, that sort of event. So faithful subject, reactive subject, obscure subject, was a new elaboration of the notion of subject in regard to one point, and there are many other points concerning the subject, in regard to the point of the position, de, uh, <coughs> in regard to the event. Concerning, uh, uh, finally, uh, the question uh, of universality, maybe was the most important point at the end. My, my work has been to link the question of universality to the study of theory of categories, finally. And to say that precisely theory of categories is theory of singularities, not theory of being as such, but theory of singularities. If we can accept to say that it's a mathematical theory of singularities, the word singularity is in fact a mathematical world too. <laughs> It's a topological world. And so the, the center of all that, and which is the center of, uh, of the world, is the concept 
of the world. What is a world? It's something, uh, the world is something very simple. <laughs> I can use the schema of the world. The world is uh, a set a big set <laughs> <laughs> because uh, it's uh, well, the world must be, it must be a more a bigger set, but it must be an inaccessible set. Inaccessibility is a concept of some form of infinity. In some sense, is the first form of radical infinity, inaccessibility. So all world is, in any case, an inaccessible multiplicity. And in this, this inaccessible signifies very simple rules that we cannot do mathematics here, but only images, mathematical images. Inaccessibility signifies that if you are an element of the world, the set of the subset of this element are also inside uh, the uh, uh, world. So we cannot exceed the world by any of classical operation of theory of sets. No. <coughs> that is the most point, uh, which is the definition of inaccessibility, is that if you have a uh, multiplicity which is element of the world, the multiplicity of all the components of uh, uh, this multiplicity is also inside the world. And this is why we can have in the world many operations concerning the set. We can pass to the set, to part of the set, and so on and so on, without going uh, <coughs> outside uh, the world. The second fundamental point is that inside, inside the world, we have a set which, is, uh, which has a structure of order. A structure of order, I name like that, between a minimum and a maximum. So, in some sense, the world by itself is first uh, an inaccessible multiplicity with a structure of order, not of the world as such, but inside the world we have a structure of order as, as, as an element of the world, naturally. All what exists in the world is an element of the world. And if we have two elements, in the world. We have always a measure of their difference. That is, you have a function, what I name, a function of identity. We have a measure of the measure in which the two elements are different or identical. So, the general idea is that the world is a universe where we can have relationship of identity of difference. We can say more generally that the world is a multiplicity in which we can appreciate the identity of the terms. Identity of non-identity. <coughs> The point is very simple. You, you, you have a measure of the distance, the difference between element A and element B in the structure of order which is inside the world. 
So, uh, if the relation of identity between A and B is maximal, you can say that from the point of view of the world, don't forget this <laughs> qualification, from the point of view of the world, A is strictly identical to B. If you have, on the contrary, something like identity of A and B equal minimum, you can say that from the point of view of the world, A and B are absolutely different. Okay. And after that, we have, it depends on the structure of order, all possibilities between mu and n of identity. So we can go from absolute identity to absolute difference with all different possibilities between absolute identity and absolute difference. With that, we have a world. <coughs> so, see, very simple. <coughs> From uh, this uh, elementary description, we have many, many consequences, uh, theory of point, theory of choice, and so on. But you see, it's the uh, heart of the question. And it's the heart of the question because it's possible, and it was my goal, in fact, it's possible to define in that sort of a context what is existence and so to introduce the fundamental philosophical difference between being and existence. It's a turning point of the logic of the world, naturally. The question of existence is introduced as such the existence of an element of the world is the identity of this element with itself. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, immediately, you say that the identity of the element with itself, uh, uh, the principle of identity uh, in Aristotle is A is identical to A. <coughs> But not in a world, precisely. Hmm. In a world, there is no obligation that uh, the distance of A to itself is the maximum. We can have different uh, possibilities of uh, the modality of the existence of an element in the world, which is that if if we have a sort of thing, identity of A, A is maximal, we can say that the element A is absolutely present in the world, without any distance to itself. If you have, on the contrary, We can say that uh, the element A is, in some sense, not present in the world, but it, be, it is in the world. And it's at the point that you must interpret the complete difference between to be and to exist. We can have the form of existence which is, in some sense, a negative existence, on the contrary of being, which is being, without any variation. So, 
Something can be in the world without existing in the world. And something can be in the world with absolute existence in the world. So to exist and to be are different. And it's, uh, it's, in a sense, a new concept of existence <laughs> by its uh, difference to, with being. In some sense, being is uh, always under the law of uh, to be or not to be, <laughs> the Hamlet, the Hamlet theorem. <laughs> But uh, there is no uh, uh, to exist or not exist. It depends of the structure of order. Because if, if you have only two possibilities in the order, effectively, it is to exist or not to exist. But if you have many possibilities, we have to exist uh, in a strong manner, to exist in a weak manner, uh, and finally to not not exist at all, but but to be. <coughs> and so Hamlet can say, uh, probably, <coughs> probably be more exact, uh, uh, to exist or not to exist, <coughs> because to be <coughs> is to be. <coughs> and so the the concept of the world is fundamentally. Uh, the concept, the place of uh, distinction between being and existence. And so we return to the strict theory of singularity. Singularity cannot be reduced to being, but include for every object, the possibility of the degree of existence in the world. And so, when you examine the question of universality, we must be in relationship not only to the question of being, but also to the question of existence. And so we have uh, the question of the degree of existence of the same multiplicity in different worlds. Because naturally, uh, the same multiplicity can pertain to many different worlds. And human being especially. <coughs> human being especially. can exist in our existence in precisely very different worlds. And I experiment that the world today for me is not the same that 40 years ago, <coughs> certainly. But to be is to be. <coughs> and uh, after that, uh, and it's my, my last point in some sense. After that, uh, in some sense, logic of the world is the logic of existence. We can say something like that. The possibility is logic of existence. That is the possibility of different forms of singularity. That is the different forms of relationship between a multiplicity and the world in which you find this multiplicity. And for that, uh, we can use a theory of categories because it's a question of relation, in fact. Relation between uh, uh, an element and the structure of order, relation of uh, existence and being, and so on. And it's uh, the, uh, the point where we have a new style, in my sense, in logic of the world, uh, very different from the style of being an event. Because being an event is largely, uh, in largely the model of mathematics. 
uh, with uh, uh, definition, consequences, demonstration, and so on. And uh, logic of the world is largely in uh, uh, more, uh, uh, more uh, in the model of theory of categories, the model of description of singularities. So we have in the first book a conceptual organization and axiomatic organization of the proposition. And in logic of the world, we have many examples, many descriptions. It is why we can find uh, architecture, uh, painting, uh, literature, uh, theater, uh, 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 war, uh, and, and so on. You can have uh, the the description of love uh, in uh, the novel of Rousseau, you can have uh, uh, a painting of the 18th century, you can find uh, 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 the theater of Sartre, uh, and so on. And it's uh, some exercises, concrete uh, uh, examples, to <coughs> explore the consequences of that sort of definition of singularity in a world. The hand of the book, uh, the hand of the book is problematic in some sense. It's problematic because uh, uh, finally uh, there is a different definition of uh, the truth in logic of the world that is being an event. Because the problem of uh, logic of the world is to examine what is the existence of a truth. A big an event was the examination of what is the being of a truth. And uh, it being an event, the solution of the problem is a generic set. The structure, the ontological structure of a truth is a generic subset of the situation. And uh, in uh, logic of the world, the question of the truth is the question of intensity of existence. So it's intensive concept, qualitative concept, and not a structural one that in being an event. And uh, at the end, I say that uh, uh, there is a problem of the articulation of the two, finally. Uh, what is the relationship between uh, generic set as uh, the ontological definition of a truth and intensity, maximal intensity of existence uh, as a definition, as a part of definition is the logic of the world. And in fact, I conclude that uh, uh, the reader must, <laughs> must uh, find the solution. <laughs> <laughs> the promise of the future. And in fact, in uh, immanency of truth, the question is taken in a third manner, neither uh, structural genericity nor intensity of existence, but absoluteness. And absoluteness is the absorption of the two. It's simultaneously intensity of existence and, uh, uh, and genericity, uh, structural genericity. So, uh, my last word, I think that uh, the comparison, in some sense, I think that uh, Logic of the world concerning uh, the truth is under the law of the world. And so 
We can hide from logic of the world what I can name the novel of uh, a truth. <coughs> the history, the magnificent and uh, spectacular history of a truth. On the side of intensity of uh, existence. The novel of truth in a world. And in fact, the point of the possibility of the real universality, the point of the possible existence of the same truth in another world, is the possibility, it's a metaphor, it's a possibility to translate a work of art in a different language. Translation of a novel from French to English. Is the strength of uh, the result is the same? If you can reproduce the intensity of existence of uh, the, the work of art from one language to another language, it's in some sense uh, existential proof that we have here uh, universality. So it's not at all the same thing that the mathematical problem of genericity uh, is an other problem. Finally, uh, more concrete in some sense, because everybody uh, uh, understands that uh, if uh, the strength of something can be translated in another language, it, that the strength is the real strength. <coughs> and. Uh, the most decisive point is the translation of a poem. I think, you know, very often it's indeed that the poem is not, it's not possible to translate really a poem. I think that on the contrary, we can see that to recognize a very important poem is the fact that it can be translated. It can be translated maintaining the strength, the artistic value of uh, the poem itself. And it's something like in the orientation, that sort of orientation which is uh, uh, examined uh, in some sense in logic of the world. We can say, uh, I say that to, to you, <laughs> that uh, we can say also that finally the, the proof of uh, the truth from one world to another world is that the translation confirms the infinity of uh, the first world. <coughs> and it is why a translation can be very different from the original and being the same. Because in the infinite, we can have the possibility of identity and difference. Uh, a characteristic of uh, logic of the world, it's a very, very, very I finish on this point, it, uh, it, it's a book which has been really uh, easy to write, pleasant to write. <laughs> Some sense I write uh, what I want. It was the world, the singularity. So I can speak of uh, everything, after all. <laughs> and so, uh, also here is something uh, like uh, baroque construction, the logic of the world. <coughs> we can, uh, we can, uh, you can examine my, my preferences, my. Uh, taste and so on, uh, because it's a question of existence, finally, and not of being. So I return to the idea that it's much more the, the novel of the truth than uh, the concept of the truth. <coughs> okay. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, so, We've already gone for an hour. Should we take a, a five-minute uh, break and, and if
if anyone wants. All minutes you want. <laughs> we are in the novel. Okay, good. Let's <laughs> uh, say just five minutes. Uh, there's coffee, there's water, there's juice, and then we'll start okay. five, quest- uh, questions. It's, uh, qu- in the question of uh, the, the structure, uh, you are in a world where five is ten. Exactly. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Infinite expansion. <laughs> yeah. uh, the restrooms are out. Oh, actually, they're they're, they're up above. Yeah. 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 C'est magnifique. Je regrette seulement qu'ils n'ont pas pu faire la vidéo parce qu'avec la démonstration, on va, on va prendre une photo. Mais après, j'ai vu qu'il y a une autre photo. Je vais faire, je vais faire de même, mais puis on peut accompagner le son avec, euh, avec la vidéo. Je, je voulais montrer que le concept est très simple. C'est ça Oui, il est très simple en réalité. Parce qu'après, on peut faire des calculs compliqués pour démontrer ceci ou cela, oui, bien, oui, sûr, bien sûr, parce que, évidemment, une fois qu'on a l'existence, alors l'existence par rapport à la différence, etc. etc. Mais c'est très simple. C'est ça. Et je pense que c'est très efficace. Pour moi aussi, c'était, c'était une démonstration. Et encore en plus, je le fais pour ça veut dire que je suis à distance de soi-même, c'est très bien. C'est très bien. Les cartes de soi-même, c'est très bien. Je que c'est ça, c'est malheureux. Et c'est donc le signe d'absence au monde, toujours. Et à la limite, le très malheureux, il se fait de mort. Ce qui veut dire qu'il veut euh, aller dans le minimum de la vie. Le très heureux, mais peut-être que ce sont des gens qui ont été en train de se faire. The capacity to produce a model that's external to V but resembles uh, as the property of a huge history now as, uh, as something that involves a movement, let's say, from one world to another. Now, I'm thinking scientific terms, let's say, to confuse it. Of course, it's confused. It's a particular model that may be a model that may be a model So one of the interesting questions is, what is, what, what is the possibility of continuity of truth in between those worlds? Even if the world is like radically different, you know, what counts? Like, what is, what is seen as this? What is visible? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, which is, is, on the one 
can do that now. I thought it was too late. Radical revolution. Yeah, radical change. 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 Radical Absolument, ça répétait comme ça. 
mais le lien qui est posé par le nom, par exemple le nom de ce travail, et c'est le nom qui signifie cet, cet universalisme, cet identité. Mais le nom qui est posé, voilà, c'est le nom qui est posé. C'est lié à la chose que je développerai dans la communauté. Et c'est le plus compliqué de l'index. Okay, maybe we should get going because our time is short. We can close the door. Are we waiting for yeah. On a des questions écrites. Uh, uh, Le monde du capital. Oui. Okay, uh, shall, shall we begin, everybody? Um, our time is short. Uh, we, have, we have two questions here. I'm going to uh, uh, get things rolling with my own question. Uh, first of all, if I, if I may, which is, is, is uh, addressing in the, in the first book, Uh, and the, the uh, uh, faithful subject. On 64 and 65, there's dis the discussion of Spartacus and Toussaint Louverture. Uh, and I, I wanted to invite Alain to, to uh, discuss the concept of resurrection. Uh, because in my reading of these, of these two pages, uh, Spartacus There's a, has a certain um, conservative uh, dimension, that is, to return home. And for me, there's, there's, a, there's a distinct break and a rupture with Toussaint Louverture, where a return to Africa, a return to some primordial community, whatever, is, isn't possible. And so Toussaint Louverture is, is forward-looking precisely because of an identification with a, a universal equality, emancipation, freedom, whatever that might be, all of those. And so if, there, if we can identify a break, at the same time, of course, there's some sort of movement of a name, Spartacus, the, the, the Spartacus, Toussaint Louverture is the black Spartacus, then Rosa, Rosa Luxemburg, the Spartacan League. What then? can we say about the nature of the concept of resurrection uh, regarding the, the <clears throat> distinction between mm, the question of novelty mm. and resurrection? Uh, you know, uh, resurrection is the possibility of something in the form of a truth to be active in another world. Okay. And uh, in, fi in fact, it's not absolutely possible to give the answer without, uh, without emanancy of truth. Mm. Uh, because uh, uh, at the end, it's absoluteness, which is <laughs> the guarantee of uh, this possibility. But we can say at the level of logic of the world that uh, 
From uh, Spartacus to, to Saint Louverture, and from Toussaint Louverture uh, to Rosa Luxembourg and uh, Liquidnecht, we have the possibility of a specific form of intensity, of intensity, which uh, is abstractly similar in some sense, because is the novelty of something, the intensity of the novelty of some form of uh, revolt. This form of revolt being completely different in the three cases. Mm -hmm. But something of the intensity of that sort of form of revolt can be recognized in the three cases. And so uh, we can say simultaneously that we have here a complete difference of words, um, Roman Empire, uh, uh, and after that, uh, colonial situation, and uh, slaves in IT, and after that, revolt of workers uh, in a capitalist uh, world. But that some part of all that is, is uh, in a transition uh, from the beginning, uh, which is uh, uh, the, the part which can be resumed in the form of the possible intensity of uh, that sort of specific revolt against the dominant order. And the revolt, of, uh, we must examine the question of the slaves in Roman Empire, because the question of the slave in Roman Empire is not at all the same as the question of the slave in uh, Haiti. Because in Roman Empire, a slave is a prisoner after a war. And the slaves came from all countries. And so, when uh, Spartacus says that the goal of the revolt is to return in their country, uh, is, uh, uh, it, it's uh, the content of the situation. It's not, uh, it's not uh, something like a restriction of uh, some, another possibility. They are not at all in the idea to, to, to destroy uh, uh, the, the, the system of the, of the slaves. But they are, the idea is that we, they, they destroy the consequence of the fact that as a prisoner they are slaves. And the only possibility to do that is to return in uh, their country. And naturally it's not at all the same goal for uh, Toussaint Louverture, because Toussaint Louverture uh, 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 won't destroy the uh, uh, slav <laughs> slavery. But at the end there is something which can recognize at the level of, uh, uh, of the political intensity of that sort of uh, action, which goes uh, from Spartacus to Spartacus uh, by uh, Toussaint Louverture. And uh, it is why the proper name is adequate. Because, as you know, uh, the, the, the name of Toussaint Louverture has been uh, the, the, the Black Spartacus. <coughs> and, uh, Rosa Luxembourg uh, named uh, the organization the Spartacist. And finally, the, the transit of the name is a symbol of the transit of intensity, which is represented by the name in different worlds. And, why, and, and so the consequences is very important to understand that resurrection uh, is not repetition. Resurrection is not repetition. Something is repeated, for example, the name, but the repetition is the support of novelty. And it's precisely the novelty that in the three cases is the same thing. Novelty of uh, uh, the revolt of the slave, novelty of the revolt of uh, the black slave, and novelty of the revolt of workers in Germany. All that can be uh, resumed in a form of resurrection. That is, in all the cases, something new. And something new inside the process of resurrection of the recognition of the intensity. And uh, uh, it, it is why uh, we, we must understand at the level of logic of the world, uh, universality 
as the possibility of resurrection, including, naturally, that uh, resurrection is not repetition. Uh, yeah, I can maybe read the questions. Yeah. Um, so we have the first one. Uh, so given the, dis the, dis the description of value by Marx in Capital, could we say that Marx is describing a world? Given that value within this world appears in the form of fetishism, which is objective, do you think your phenomenology is compatible with Marx? It would be for me a sad novel that it's not compatible with Marx. Certainly, and I. I, I, I it's. Uh, it's uh, provision uh, that you propose here, yeah. uh, that is uh, the vision of, uh, of uh, the description of uh, the fetishism of Maganda is uh, as in some sense the definition of a world, because it's a description of the capitalistic world in its center, absolutely. And it's uh, very useful today to think that at the end, capitalism can be uh, think as a world. Because uh, it's uh, always an attempt to, for capitalism to, to, to affirm that it's not a world, precisely. It's a system, a structure, a possibility, a good possibility of for many worlds, or for all worlds, and so on. And it's, much more critique to say, but it's a world, really. It's a determination, and we can, in fact, uh, across uh, fetishes, but with other, also the, the, the tendency of profit and so on, we can determine parameters of this world, and at the end, observe what is the structure of order in that sort of... Uh, And uh, the structure of order is the structure of classes at the end. But uh, the construction of the order is inside uh, uh, a principle of uh, difference and identity, which we can uh, observe uh, in the, 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 the basis structure of uh, capitalism. So my answer is uh, yes, and I appreciate it. That's I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and here we have a question concerning the logic of scales, um, Echelle. Um, the questions of location and uh, compatibility brought together in logics of worlds under the principle of the coherence of bodies, mm -hmm. page uh, 485, suggests that your, pos your position concerning the relation between the scale of an object and its logic is similar to that of Laurent Notal and his idea of scale relativity. Could this be the case? Uh, Laurent, Laurent Notal is near a friend for me and uh, I, uh, my, uh, my answer is yes too. <laughs> Certainly, I, I think that the, the attempt of uh, Laurent Hotel, the difficult attempt, which uh, is, is front of a big resistance of the classic theory of relativity, that is to, to introduce in relativity, uh, at the end, a new geometry, uh, differential geometry of an uh, other style, is uh, can be described as the attempt to construct something like a world of relativity, and not only a principle or a structure. And so uh, I appreciate that you, uh, <coughs> you know uh, the work of Laurent Nottal, and uh, if one day I speak of uh, physics, which is a hard work, difficult work, but uh, a constant temptation for me, uh, I, I certainly uh, take the example of uh, Laurent Nottal, uh, the, the earth of the man. <coughs> yes. Uh, 
um, <clears throat> so rereading logics, I noticed that your work often abuts Franz Fanon, um, in particular here where you reference the Dem de la Terre um, when describing the math theme for the subjectivated body. Um, but the name is never spoken, and I'm kind of curious about how you would describe uh, your project's relationship uh, to Fanon. Oui. Donc il remarque une certaine Pardon. une proximité avec Fanon et les derniers de la Terre, euh, surtout euh, au moment de la, la, la construction du corps subjectivé sans que Fanon soit nommé. Mm -hmm. euh, donc, euh, est-ce que, est que tu oui, peux... Oui, que est en lien Fanon Et it was absolutely possible to name Fanon. Uh, it was not uh, my idea at the moment. <laughs> But uh, uh, from the very beginning of my, uh, my philosophical uh, construction, uh, I have read Fanon uh, at the beginning with enthusiasm, in fact. Uh, and and I, I, I was a fan of Fanon uh, from my Sartrean origin. <laughs> so, so it's a, and uh, I, I think that the, the, the description of, uh, of uh, the, the, the structure of oppression, the specific oppression, uh, for example, of African countries and so on by Fanon, and uh, the, the, the vision of our world uh, with the operation, the intellectual and descriptive operation of Fanon <laughs> are very striking and very interesting, no problem. <laughs> yes. Um, in the uh, fourth section of the first part of the greater um, logic, Uh, titled Greater Logic and Ordinary Logic, uh, page 173. Um, you write that um, the materialist dialectic undermines this schema of referring to uh, the question of the originariness of language um, as it's approached by analytic philosophy and phenomenology. Um, and you write the materialist dialectic undermines this schema, replacing it with the pre-linguistic operations which ground the consistency of a theory. As a consequence, logic, formal logic included, not to mention rhetoric, all appear care for what they are, derivative construction, detailed study is a matter for, for, for anthropology. So, what page? Okay, so can we find the quote oh, first? What, 174, it's the oh. paragraph in the middle. With the point, oh, this... Uh, yes. Clearly see? We can I, clearly see, is that the yeah. paragraph? Yeah. As yes. a consequence, logic, formal logic... Mm. Uh, uh, is a matter for anthropology. Oh dear, the materialist dialectics undermine. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and so what I'm uh, wondering is um, if this means that you believe the distinct human languages um, are derivative of distinct worlds um, and if topoi uh, can be used to mm -hmm. study these relations. Est-ce que les, les différents euh, langages euh, humains, langues humaines dérivent des, des mondes différents et sont dérivés des mondes différents Et est-ce que la théorie des, des, des topologies, des, des la théorie. topologiques, euh, peut être utilisée pour, euh, pour étudier le, ces langages Je pense que si vous voulez étudier ce difference of uh, languages. Uh, we, we must use, in my opinion, it's, it's not my speciality, uh, <coughs> but you, you must use some, uh, some categorical concepts, some categories of, uh, of the theory of, of categories, precisely. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, As you know, the difference between two different languages is a very complex question mm -hmm. because we don't know exactly what is the mediation or finally the, the, the order system 
which is latent in a definite language. And uh, the difficulty is also uh, the difficulty to find a mediation. Uh, what is, uh, uh, because we cannot assume that uh, with different languages we have the same words. It's not sure, after all. Mm -hmm. It's not sure. And uh, uh, it has been uh, many times uh, affirmed that uh, uh, two languages constitute, in fact, uh, two different worlds. And so, uh, uh, the, the, the question is to have a rigorous doctrine of what is a difference. It is a point. It's an example, uh, a very striking example, of the difficulty to organize the concept of difference. Why? Because it, uh, I have right that the concept of difference defines a world in some sense. It's the definition of a world. Even if you have the same things in a world, uh, it's not the same world, because the key of the intelligibility of the world is not the thing in the world, but the relationship between the things, which constitute, finally, uh, the, the world. And language is a, is a sort of witness of all that. The witness of, uh, of differences uh, in the world. <coughs> For example, uh, between French and English, there is many differences concerning the possibility to describe the same object. For example, uh, in English, it, uh, uh, you have many small differences which cannot exist in French. <coughs> and it is why English poetry is so difficult to translate, because uh, the description of something is, uh, is not under the same laws. <coughs> the French the French is practically always the reduction of difference to unity. And the, the English language is much more the, the transformation of unity in differences. And it is why the French philosophy is Descartes and the, the English philosophy is empirism. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, a big concept and it's okay, big descriptions. And so, uh, 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 but we, we can say that we can study all that with uh, uh, the idea to construct the uh, world in which the difference of two languages can exist as a difference, precisely. So, but in the same world. Alors, what is the same world possible for two languages? It's, a, it's a, the universe of possible languages. And so, linguistic, the linguistic science, begins always, in some sense, by the abstract description of what is a language. That is the construction of a world in which we can organize the thinking of the difference between languages. But it's... A, it's a, it's, a, it's a terrible work, it's a terrible work, and it is why uh, linguistic is, a, is a so interesting in some sense, because it's an exercise uh, concerning difference, which is very subtle and uh, very interesting. But uh, uh, for the philosopher, the difference of language is... is uh, an obstacle, <laughs> naturally, <laughs> because uh, uh, to, to propose uh, a universal concept is uh, also the idea that you can have this concept in all lang possible languages, but uh, maybe it's not true, but it's not true. When you read a translation in English of a French text, generally you recognize immediately that it was a French text, <laughs> and not an English one. <laughs> but it's not. But after all, we can say that 
the translation is precisely the construction of a world in which we can uh, uh, organize the difference between the two languages. And it is why, in some sense, translation, to translate, is a, uh, is a philosophical uh, business. <laughs> because it's a, it's a, it's, it's, we are really in logic, in, in logic of the world, in the translation. It's the logic of the world. And, and you know, it's a support, as it, it, as it is, uh, in logic of the world, is the support of the discovery of some universality. Because translation is impossible if you have the idea that universality does not exist at all. So you have not translation, you have production of something completely different under the name of translation. If translation has really a signification, uh, it's because you translate in a different world something, uh, uh, something universal. And it's a resurrection. Okay, it's a resurrection. It's not a repetition. It cannot be a repetition. Um, I have kind of written the question down, but I'll read it slowly in return. Okay. Uh, this question has to do with uh, two ways in which you kind of narrated the relationship between the, your books in the last, or the last three days, where uh, day after yesterday, you began by talking about how in 1982 you were looking at a decade of counter revolution, and that had to do with, and from there kind of emerged the, the, the project of. Uh, being an event as opposed to a theory of the subject. But on the other hand, the way in which you kind of narrated this movement has been in terms of arriving at the end of a book and then a philosophical problem arises and then you try to resolve it in the, in the next book. So now, my question to basically have to do with these two ways of narrating is that in, in late Althusser, we sometimes find this kind of dichotomy of a rationalist materialism and elitary materialism. In your work, you seem to have kind of escaped this uh, this kind of conceptualization by articulating the problem in terms of the event and what you in Saint Paul call a philosophy for the event. Uh, how or why have you been able to avert a problem that Althusser falls prey to? Uh, was it because you were philosophically mindful of the problem as an aporia that needed to be overcome? Or does it have something to do with the difference between your kind of historical situation and the nature of political engagement in Althusser in the 1670s and you? What, what, what's the Althusser's distinction? Uh, the rationalist materialism and the materialism. Rash okay. What's the second? Uh, rationalist uh, imperialism. Uh, imperialism. And aleatory materialism. Oh, and aleatory oh, yeah. yeah. materialism. Um, uh, Ah. Okay, so it's long question. <laughs> well, in the question of the construction of a new world, <laughs> to understand or to, to organize the discussion. <laughs> Alors, tu parles de comment en fait tu organises ce lien entre tes trois livres, ou chaque fois en fait tu développes ton, ton livre comme être l'événement, et après en fait tu, tu arrives à la fin du livre et tu découvres un nouveau philosophie, problème philosophique qui apparaît dans oui. ton que tu essaies de résoudre dans un autre livre. Et après, il parle de cette distinction de Althusser entre le matérialisme rationaliste et le matérialisme aléatoire. Et comment on fait cette apo aporie de cette distinction de, de, entre deux types du matérialisme était importante pour toi Quelle était la dernière sentence de la question ah, comment, comment tu as échappé à cette aporie entre le matérialisme rationaliste et le matérialisme aléatoire Oui, c'est un point pratiquement pratiquement la question d'être un événement. Parce que l'événement est un aléatoire concept. Event is something which is inside a chance, uh, probability and improbability, surprise, uh, something which, uh, uh, which is uh, outside uh, the established laws of, uh, of the world. 
So, for me, the truth is always the result of a, a sort of intersection of something on the side of uh, aleatory materialism, if you want, and something which is on the side of a st rational structure. Yeah. Because the truth is the consequences in a field of uh, rational structure of something uh, which uh, happened by chance, in some sense. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, I think that, as it, as it happens sometimes in Althusser, uh, you have, uh, you have uh, uh, something which is uh, an opposition without dialectics. <laughs> opposition of two terms without dialectics. And uh, I think yeah, there is no opposition between rational materialism and uh, aleatory materialism, in fact. Because uh, uh, precisely uh, the materiality of uh, truth is uh, composed of uh, dialectics between chance and necessity. Well, no? I even think we spoke about it once when I was speculating to what extent actually. Althusser to took this concept of the aleatory materialism mm -hmm. from from your work actually from mm -hmm. this thinking of contingency and and the event as, mm -hmm. because it's actually very late text in uh, for Althusser himself. Yeah. Yes, but uh, but there is a, 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 an organization of uh, uh, of. Uh, is, there is an organization of the question of uh, chance and so on in an opposition between two forms of materialism. But it's not a necessity at all. Uh, it, uh, uh, something which happened by chance is as material as something which happened by necessity. The question is not uh, of uh, materialism, in fact. The question, as often, is the question, uh, is a dialectical question. That is, there is a possibility to dialectize the opposition between uh, aleatory concept uh, and uh, rationalist concept. And rationalist is no good because there is a rationalism of the chance. <laughs> and it's a big part of, uh, of contemporary thinking in the field of science itself to, to find the rationality of uh, probability. Or in probability. Um, in, in listening to the discussion, as well as in many points in the text, um, I've I've become very curious about what you might say to the adoption or taking up of many of the principles and logics of world um, to try to arrive at a, a general theory of historical change, especially because. Um, I was just talking with Ken about this and, and my colleague John, who is um, also a, in, in the history department, and a lot of the way that we're trained is, is history as narrative and representation. Um, and so I'm curious as to where that meets the ontological in this, but also how we can use this to understand how either temporally we move after a particular fissure, such as you know classically the French Revolution, from one world to a world that looks very different, or spatially, when things like, for instance, the homogenization of time make distinct worlds into one, forcibly, often. Um, and so, there, I mean, there's a passage at the very end of the Scolium chapter on page 503 of the English, just before the conclusion. Um, and just the final line of that, I think, Point by point, a body reorganizes itself, making appear in the world ever more singular yes. consequences. Wait one second. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Okay, five, five, oh, three. At the very bottom. Yes, it's the very last one. Okay. Point by point, a body reorganizes itself, making appear in the world ever more singular consequences, which subjectively weave a truth about which can be said that it will render eternal the present of the present. 
So the rendering eternal, um, or the not rendering eternal, when, when we think about historical change, is, is, is there something here for someone who wants to tell a story about historical change, is my question. Et à partir de là, est-ce qu'il est possible d'élaborer, concevable, d'élaborer une théorie générale du changement, de, de la transformation historique, au-delà de l'histoire comme représentation? Oui. Uh, I think, I think uh, all attempt to define uh, general theory of uh, historical change must be exposed to reduce the part of chance in all that to the necessity. I am not saying that it's impossible to write something in the direction of a general theory of change in the form, in fact, of the point you discussed before, that is the description of the of a world, in an historical world, but a world. Finally, history is always a theory of a world, <coughs> a world which is uh, the world, uh, uh, maybe uh, the world of uh, of uh, Roman Empire uh, or the contemporary world or uh, no. So. History is not an uh, empirical description of fact, uh, because it, uh, it's, uh, it's without interest. History is always the proposition of a structure. Uh, there is many forms of structure, uh, but uh, as we have said, uh, uh, Marxism uh, is uh, the theory, the historical theory of uh, the contemporary world, the name of which is capitalism. But uh, you, 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 when you describe a world, you are also in the necessity to accept uh, that inside this world can, something can happen. And you can eventually uh, organize the thinking of the, of the type of uh, multiplicity inside the world, which is more exposed to the eruption of chance than other parts. For example, it being an event, I explain that uh, some form of multiplicity that I name eventual sites are more exposed to uh, become the support of an event than others. The classical example is inside your question, in the concept of proletariat, uh, in the work of Marx. What is proletariat? Proletariat is precisely uh, the eventual site for Marx, the eventual site of, uh, of uh, the capitalist uh, world. If some drastic event can happen in this world, it has been uh, inside and by the revolts, uh, the, the, protestation, the existence of proletariat, which is the eventual site of the capitalist world. But uh, the, the strict history cannot go to say that the event is a necessity. <coughs> so it's not because you describe proletariat as the place where the possibility of uh, an event uh, is maximal, you cannot confuse this affirmation with the affirmation that the event is a necessity. And it has been all along the question of uh, revolution between chance and necessity. And there is, a, 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 I think, that dogmatic Marxism is Marxist, we transform the uh, degree of possibility in the degree of necessity. And the consequence is that the best is to do nothing. 
in fact, the, the consequence is the best idea to do nothing, because history is working for us. But it's never true that history is working for us. Maybe history is working near us, <coughs> near the possibility, and we can uh, work uh, for uh, uh, near the eventual site uh, uh, to, to organize uh, the possible best uh, uh, answer to the event. But we cannot work uh, only in the idea that finally uh, uh, there is an historical necessity and we, the, the, the revolution is inevitable. Marx itself and the true Marxist was finally saying uh, uh, it's uh, 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 maybe revolution, uh, maybe barbarie, destruction, the end of the world. And was not, <coughs> and uh, frankly, today uh, we can say more than Marx that uh, uh, history does not work for us. <coughs> and uh, uh, but when when you say that history does not work for us, it's not uh, the conclusion is not uh, uh, to be uh, sad and uh, nihilistic and so on. The, uh, the, the consequence is that. You must work in the direction of reconstitution of something in the eventual side, in fact, in the organization of the eventual side, in the direction of a subjective uh, possibility to transform immediately the event, if even a small event, in something positive. And it's a very important discussion because a part of the Marxist legacy has been transformed in the uh, theory of the historical necessity. But the historical necessity, uh, in some sense, uh, can be described in the form of the necessity of the law of the world. For example, concentration of capital is a necessity, certainly. <laughs> And, uh, Uh, many facts of capitalism are uh, the necessity of the, uh, are laws of the development of capitalism. That is the laws of the world. But uh, uh, the laws of the world don't create the, 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 the create the, 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 the event. They only create the place and the possibility at the of an event. And you cannot refuse uh, the kind of all forms of chance uh, in, in, in all political meditation. You cannot. And I know that, uh, in some sense, uh, historical necessity can be a more optimistic vision. <laughs> If a big history works for us, it's a good news. <laughs> But it's never really true, alas. <laughs> But can I? I also, if I can maybe develop on that, I think you say somewhere, I'm not sure, I think it's in being an event, you say that history with big age uh, doesn't exist, there's only historicity. Mm. So in a sense, I would say also like a history, as the, the, the flow of history for you, it, it just doesn't exist. I think if we can talk about history as such, I think there would be only histories which would be actually already the recollection uh, of the connection to the event of the faithful subject that is posterior mm -hmm. to the event. Uh, that's why I think once I compare this a little bit to Walter Benjamin's, the, the thesis on, uh, the short article, the five thesis on history, where he talks about this difference between the, the general historiography and, and you know, the dialectical uh, materialist history. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this is maybe just to add to this um, mm. uh, to this discourse. I mean, history is just the activity of the faithful subject that follows the event. You want to trace the the event. And uh, I, I, it's a lateral remark, but uh, I prefer to say uh, materialist uh, dialectic so than dialectical materialism. 
Yes. Because you have to say, but I read it. Ah, he <laughs> <laughs> ah, <you> caught me. <laughs> yes. uh, 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 it's because there is precisely a uh, tradition, the tradition in the side of uh, uh, dialectical materialism, which is in the direction of the necessity. Because it's the, the support is materialism. Mm. Materialism, uh, in the positivist vision, is uh, always the, the domain of necessity. If you say in the reverse, uh, uh, materialist dialectics, it's dialectics which is uh, the center. Mm. Yeah. And dialectics is, uh, uh, is not the affirmation of necessity is a much more a possible uh, dimension of the real. And materialist, certainly, because we are not idealists. But uh, I propose a difference between the two, uh, between the order of the, of the world. So can I ask then about also, on this discussion, the concept of a, a monde tendu, mm -hmm. a tensed world on 422? Because it's, uh, it's, it's such a, well, yes, it, it's it, such a it, short section. It's it, a short section, yes. and, and and yet it seems so important on the question of a point. And I and we have I have the impression that we can distinguish a montendu where there where uh, it's a decision is of an atone, everywhere an atone world. Yes. Okay. Yes, but it's a, it's a, it's a new form of. A, the question of invental side, in yes. fact. A tendered world is a world in which we have so many uh, uh, contradictions, so many tensions, so many... Uh, that we have many possibilities uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, something new. But we have uh, some world in which the possibility uh, is strictly reduced by the fact that we cannot observe uh, uh, Topologically, some eventual sides, and so we can we can go in the direction, the historical direction, uh, which uh, propose difference of situation. I don't say that it's nonsense to say that the situation is good or bad. <laughs> Naturally, it has a, it has a signification. For example, uh, between uh, uh, between the analysis of the world as a tensed world or a world at all, an atom, atom world. But it's a, a question of concrete analysis of the situation. It's not the question of the necessity of an event. It's a question of uh, uh, the situation not only in, uh, on the side of the event, but on the side of uh, a possible activism in the direction of uh, 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 the, 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 the consequences of an event, if event exist. We must be prepared to an event. Even if you don't know when the event occurs, we must be prepared to an event. That is, that is the political activity is always to, to be prepared uh, to, to, to an event. And we have some knowledge of the question because precisely we have example of resurrection. So, uh, Probably an event is also the possibility of a resurrection. But resurrection, we, 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 we know the past. So we, we know the, the, the events uh, in the field of politics, in the field of art. Okay, in the field of politics is perfectly clear. We return to why, uh, why uh, Rosa Luxembourg uh, uh, uses the name of Spartacus. Is really, its goal is to prepare something, finally, in the name of Spartacus, that is the resurrection of something, which is certainly completely different, but it's the same thing that to be prepared to an event. But to be prepared to an event is not the same thing that affirms that the event is a necessity. We cannot confuse the two. Somewhat 
Can you then leave a little skeptical question to ask? I wanted to ask about the title logics of worlds, which is about these two plurals that here, the logique and the monde. I, the second plural is very evident, worlds, mold, de, de, de. Um, I guess what I'm curious about is whether there really are multiple logics. So reading the book, I had the sense of mine of one logic of multiple worlds. And I guess the suspicion I had is if there were more than one logic, or how can I put this differently? That if um, the truth can be translated across different worlds, it raises the question of whether there's in fact one theory of worlds and therefore ultimately only one world because the truth can be translated across it. So we think we've moved from one world to another, but in fact, the fact that this has happened only attests to the fact that there's not plurality of worlds, but only one yeah. world. Uh, Étant donné le pluriel euh, répété, logique, pluriel, monde, pluriel, euh, euh, étant donné que il, euh, nous con euh, constatons qu'il est possible de traduire d'un monde à un autre, est-ce que ce fait de cette possibilité n'implique pas qu'à la fin, il n'y a qu'un seul monde mm -hmm. Un seul logique. Et aussi une seule logique. Uh, you, 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 you know, the, the, we must return to understand the question to, to the theory of categories. The theory of categories is explicitly the theory of the plurality, possible plurality of logics. For example, the theory of category itself is not in classical logic is in intuitionistic logic. And uh, why? Because if you must speak of plurality of words, we cannot use the principle of excluded middle. Because we must observe the difference as such. And so we cannot say either the world is like that, or there is no world at all. And translation is also to, uh, always an exercise of uh, passage from a logic to another logic. Uh, it's obscene, because uh, uh, the every language is also a form of uh, logic of signification. The translation, precisely, is not at all repetition. Translation is precisely the transformation and the passage from a logic to another logic without repetition of the first logic in the second. Je, I, I, translation is a proof that we can have something universal inside different logics. And it's not at all because you translate something, some, some multiplicity of the world, in a multiplicity of another world, that uh, the world becomes the same. Maybe you can produce sometimes a fusion of two different worlds. It's a possibility. It's a possibility among many other possibilities. It's uh, sure that uh, in history we can observe that uh, uh, two countries which were completely different with many lo languages uh, become uh, some parts of Roman Empire uh, uh, where everybody speaks Latin. <coughs> okay, but uh, uh, it's not at all the, 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 the conclusion is not at all that there exists uh, only one world. You know, probably uh, the question of the multiplicity of worlds is absolute. I, uh, my vision, but it's an imaginary vision, <coughs> my vision is that uh, there exists, as in the form of the universe, as such, an infinity of different worlds. Like one world, 
composed of uh, galaxies and so on and so on, is only a small part of the big infinity of completely different worlds. So, I, there is the, the, the difference are in the infinite. And it is why we cannot think of a total reduction of difference, either the difference of the world or the difference of logics of the world. The multiplicity here is the absolute law of existence. But uh, local unification between two worlds uh, is a possibility. In some sense, uh, there is something like that uh, in love, <laughs> for example. The attempt to create a world which, in some sense, is uh, the subjective uh, fusion of uh, two different worlds at the beginning and to construct a new world with elements of, uh, of, which come from two different subjectivities, that is, two different subjective representations of the world. And creation are always uh, in that sort of direction, naturally. But it's always inside a form of logic of the world. If we have time maybe for one or two more questions, if there are any more. I have a question. Yes. I read today that Quebec had passed a law banning the burqa from public spaces. Excuse me? I read today that Quebec has passed a law banning the burqa from public spaces. Yeah. And so I'm Quebec, the Quebec a, a adopted a law uh, to ban the burqa, la burqa, mm -hmm. uh, la voile. Um, whether this affects the mathematics of the, of the subject, the four subjective destinations described in book one, and whether what has happened in the last ten years would require a modification of the statement that political Islamism belongs to the category of the obscure. Est-ce que, est que les développements des dix dernières années, est-ce que nous devons toujours dire que l'islam euh, est euh, du côté de l'obscur, du sujet obscur et... Est-ce que cette interdiction change les, les mathématiques du sujet Non Est-ce que... 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 Uh, no, it, it, clearly, clear, clearly, uh, clearly, that sort of decision, uh, which is uh, uh, the state decision to, to negate some, the existence of somebody, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's always in relationship with reactive subject, certainly. And uh, uh, you know, capitalism is always searching to create new enemies because the only enemy real for him is uh, politics against capitalism. But to present cap the capitalist society as a model, as a paradigm, as a, the goal of all the history, you must always create enemies of that. And uh, it's clear that today uh, Islam has been designed as a sort of enemy. And when you construct an enemy, uh, you have always a, a form of existence of the enemy, naturally. Because uh, if you say you are enemies, the enemy uh, can uh, create the subjectivity to be enemy or two. And uh, it has been very often the case uh, of uh, the history of capitalism in the form of nationalism, colonialism, civilization against barbarie, uh, uh, laicity against religion, and so on. All that sort of construction 
à nécessiter to protect the capitalism, to be visible as the real world uh, and uh, the real question for humanity as such. And so I, I, I agree with you. It, it's a proposition to be forever uh, in the figure of the reactive subjectivity. Because, uh, uh, in fact, uh, capitalism uh, is a constant creation of uh, reactive subjectivity against uh, faithful subjectivity, but also against some form of uh, obscure subject. The war uh, against Hitler and the Nazis was uh, effectively a war against a form of uh, obscure subject. But in any case, it's not... Uh, it's the objective is not at all the positive transformation of the world as it is, but the conservation of the world as it is. And uh, we, we, uh, the, 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 the drama in that sort of co construction is that the construction of the enemy finally constructs really an enemy. <coughs> but the false enemy becomes a true enemy by the mechanism of the designation, the construction of uh, the contradiction. And it is why today, uh, uh, in, in, a, in a quiet country as France, very quiet in fact, you have terrible law, progressively, uh, concerning the necessity of a big police, of uh, a new form of repression, and so on, and so on. Even if you were in a civil war, but you are not at all in a civil war. But uh, the spirit of the state is to organize a false civil war to protect its uh, proper hegemony. <laughs> Last question. No, last question. No, sorry. <laughs> I maybe have one. Not not existent of a last An opening. <laughs> opening. I was wondering this connect this connection between you know the concept of the subject that appears and being an event as one concept, and then the you know the multiple types of uh, subject that you propose in logics of worlds. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like the uh, how do how do you elaborate this connection again between the one subject that is but exists as multiplicity of those three types mm. of subject and do you also elaborate this connection between the two in, in the immanence of truth? Um. Uh, I don't know. No? <laughs> uh. I don't know. In, in, in fact, uh, uh, in immanence of truth, uh, the center is not the question of the subject. Mm -hmm. The question of the subject for me is resolved for the essential in the two first book. It's uh, much more the, the question of truth, mm -hmm. which, is, which is not complete. Finally, with the disposition of a faithful subject, a reactive subject, and obscure subject, I have something which is which I, I am satisfied by this disposition and uh, I can use uh, this uh, construction for uh, many possible goals. The, the question of, uh, of uh, the final question of universality is not immediately on the side of the subject because we must first resolve the question of absoluteness. When we have absoluteness, we have the possibility to uh, think in a new manner all procedures of truth. And it's the end of uh, uh, immanence of truth. The end of immanence of truth is about politics, love, science, art, in details. And so I speak of the subject, uh, the subjectivation of all that, but uh, uh, it's not, uh, uh, I don't propose a new uh, concept of uh, subjectivity, except probably 
the fact that the question of the subject uh, is also inside the question of the infinite, which is not really active in the two first books. I, I can say that to, to be to become an activist of a truth is in some sense to accept that your finitude is in relationship to the infinite. And it's not easy to accept something like that. <coughs> it's not so easy. Because uh, finitude is the immediate law of uh, the world as it is. And so the, 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 the affect of the truth is the affect of our immanence to finitude by something which is in relationship with the infinite. Without transcendence, it's uh, the immanence of the infinite, the part of immanence of the infinite. I agree with Spinoza uh, in some sense. At the end of the ethics, Spinoza says that uh, sometimes uh, we, we know that we are eternal. <coughs> we know that we are eternal. It's, a, it's a, the true life. It's true. Without any God uh, and so on and so on, we, we, we can say that sometimes uh, we, we know that we are eternal in the sense that we know that we are in relationship to the infinity. Naturally, we are mortal and so on. Uh, are, there is no uh, life after the life. But inside, in immanence to the life, we know that uh, life itself uh, is in fact eternal. It is eternity in the time, not outside the time. And it, 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 is, it is that sort of thing which is really interesting in life. The rest, in some sense, is a, a good form of animality. And uh, I understand that uh, maybe uh, sometimes uh, we can think that it is the best after all. Why all the track of infinity and so on, to be an activist on something. Uh, and uh, be quiet after all. <coughs> and uh, the state, the state politically, and the state more generally, the state of the situation, I, I name it in being an event, is always saying to us, be quiet, be at your place, at your good place, we propose to you a good place. And, uh, at the end, the state finished by the all places are good after all. <coughs> so don't move. But I think, I think really that, uh, and by experience, by concrete experience, that uh, what is really uh, uh, signification, what is really intense, what is really is that sort of proximity to the infinite, infinitude itself, proximity of the infinitude, which uh, we can uh, experiment in the four fields of truth, finally. Science, uh, work of art, uh, politics, uh, and love. And when we are inside something like that, Really inside something like that, we know we are, that we are eternal. Without eternity, <laughs> we are eternal. <laughs> Frankly, it's the last word. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to I want to thank everyone. So, so many of us have come from far away, uh, and just to have such a degree of intensity for three days straight <laughs> is wonderful. For me, I've certainly been helped 
in my orientation to at least be a little more ready for the event, the next <laughs> event, when it comes. I hope, uh, I hope, I think all of us have, uh, have, have felt that way. I certainly have. And so I want to thank Jana, I want to thank Ken, everyone here, and above all, Alan Badiou, uh, for making this uh, discussion possible. And so it's, it's certainly not the last word, it's to be continued. And uh, I look forward to that continuation. <laughs> Merci. Yeah, and Merci. I, I would like to maybe add that uh, um, since we have your emails, thanks to the applications that yes. we ask you to send us, so we'll keep you updated. Um, there will be, uh, I mean, here we have at least an audio recording, but we can send you the links uh, with the video so that you can, you know, sort of hear again what happened. Yeah. So we'll have video for days. the first two days, we'll um, have audio from today. And in case you were actually interested, I'd like to let you know that we're also planning two more events on the other part of the globe. That's right. <laughs> so if you have means and time to come, you would be very much welcome. There's um, on the, the 14th and 15th of November, we're doing a symposium on the effect of the events of 68 uh, on the philosophical thought with Jacques Rancière and other philosophers like Patrice Maniglier, uh, Vincent Jacques, uh, Nick will be there. Um, you know, I can send uh, more information. And then I think probably more interesting for you, uh, in approximately mid-April, I think it's 12 and 13 April, um, I can send further details, we're planning a very big symposium also in Prague, in Czech Republic, on Alain Badiou and the relationship to set theory. So there will be many mathematicians, uh, you know, prominent philosophers working on Alain Badiou. Alain Badiou, hopefully himself, uh, will, will move to Prague too. And so I can send you closer in, more information about that. And, uh, you know, if you want to come to the other part of the globe, uh, you would be very much welcome to participate. And, in and I, I would add also for those of us from Princeton, because because uh, we're the French, French and Italian department, we're co-sponsoring with the Academy of Sciences in Prague. It would be great if we could uh, help not just uh, me to go over there, but uh, also some, some of other Princetonians. And if there are other ways that we could uh, bring any of us into that, uh, that, would, that would be great. And so, so let's, uh, let's, let's try to do that. And uh, so this, this, these are both gonna be uh, with the Academy of Sciences in Prague, and, and we look forward yeah. to that as well. And don't forget that there are three more talks that Badiou will give That's next right. week in New York. So, so. next week, what, what's the schedule for the talks next week? Do uh, we know? Week, so 20, 20, 20, 26, 20, 25, 26, and uh, 29. Yes. Uh, with with NYU and uh, Miguel Abreu and uh, NYU uh, Consulat de France and the, and, and, the, and, the, and the French Consulate. The Consulat de France is 29? Uh, no, Consulat de France is uh, 26. Ah, okay. I don't know. NIU 25, Consulat de France 26, and uh, uh, Miguel Abreu 29. Ah, okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank